welcome to the American Islamic College. We're about to begin, so if you kindly of turn your cell phones off, we'd be appreciated. Thank you. Tonight we have with us a distinguished guest, Dr. Ahmed Al Shamsi, Assistant Professor at the University of Chicago. Dr. Shamsi studies the intellectual history of Islam, focusing on Islamic law and theology, cultures of morality and literacy, and classical Islamic education. He is particularly interested in the changing ways that religious authority has been constructed and interpreted in the Muslim tradition. He is the author of The Canonization of Islamic Law, a social, social and intellectual history, and is now working on a study of the reinvention of the Islamic scholarly tradition and its textual canon via the printing press in the early 20th century. Other ongoing research projects investigate the influence of the Greek sage Galen on Islamic thought and the construction of self-identity among early Muslims. He teaches courses on all aspects of Islamic thought in the classical Muslim disciplines, and he is an associate faculty member at the Divinity School at the University. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Ahmed al -Shamp. Thank you very much for this introduction. And, um, Thank you for inviting me, and also thank you for all of you coming. I hope you didn't just come for the nice food. Um, <clears throat> so the topic of my talk today is um, Islamic education between madrasa and university. Um, and so the question that I uh, took this talk as an opportunity to think about uh, is uh, what exactly the difference is between teaching Islamic studies uh, at a university and between teaching it at a madrasa, um, is there in fact is there in fact a difference? Is there in fact a, a, a useful distinction to be made between these two institutions of of learning? Um, and so I, I wanted to uh, to start with uh, by uh, throwing out uh, a number of stereotypes that um, you will encounter when thinking about. Um, uh, the madrasa and the university. Uh, so the first stereotype, the first set of stereotypes would be um, held by uh, um, people who have received a traditional education at the madrasa uh, regarding uh, what it means to study Islamic studies at a university. So um, these stereotypes would include, um, this is a place, uh, how can you study the Islamic tradition at a um, at a place that is so uh, characterized by relativism, moral relativism. So, uh, um, how can you study Islamic studies in a place that teaches uh, Islam by non-Muslims? There's the, the whole tradition of Orientalism. Um, um, uh, to what extent can you uh, study Islamic studies with somebody who does not have a proper grounding in the Islamic tradition? Uh, uh, many of the courses you, you are studying, you, uh, you might be studying with people who have absolutely no previous knowledge, which means that the, the courses you are studying are not uh, particularly rigorous. Um, so overall there is a stereotype about an environment that is not Islamic. Um, 18 to 20 year old uh, uh, students running wild um, and you have a tradition of, of teaching about Islam that is um, at least possibly problematic. That's one side. Uh, the, the other set of stereotypes would be uh, by members of the university uh, against uh, madrasa education. And uh, it would include something like, well, this is just some sort of Sunday school uh, based on uncritical reading of texts, uh, primarily uh, uh, memorization, uh, which is held to be uh, not a critical faculty, um, very often ultra-conservative uh, ultra in terms of its political stand or its, its, its so social stand, uh, taught by immigrants who know nothing about the host country, which means that uh, you will uh, produce some sort of ghetto mentality uh, among its graduates. Now, these are two sets of stereotypes, and I'm not saying that I'm, uh, that I'm endorsing them. Uh, but I think it uh, uh, might be an interesting point to start from um, uh, when um, trying to think through what 
the, 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 the phenomenon of teaching Islamic uh, studies has become in the United States in the last couple of decades. Uh, so what I want to argue in this, in this talk today is that, um, that the classical Islamic madrasa and the modern uh, university are products of two different historical processes and thereby display different tendencies today. But also that they share inherent features which, are, which make it suitable uh, to compare them. And I would argue also suitable for the emergence of hybrid institutions uh, such as the AIC that seek to combine um, its positive features. Uh, so let me start with uh, Islamic education and the uh, history of the madrasa. Um, the madrasa as, as an institution of learning is, uh, did not begin with the Prophet Muhammad. Um, the, the madrasa is an institution that emerges sometimes maybe 350, 400, <coughs> maybe more than 400 years after, uh, after the death of Muhammad. Um, but we, uh, that does not mean that we have no uh, tradition of learning before that. Uh, rather, we, ha we, we already find in the Qur'an um, uh, a large emphasis on, um, uh, on knowledge and the urge to contemplate. So there's, there's two large features that you find again and again repeated in the Qur'an. First of all is the urge to contemplate the natural world, um, life, plant life, animal life. Um, to contemplate the cosmos, um, but also to contemplate history, uh, to contemplate civilizations, other civilizations, previous civilizations, and their fates. Um, so there is, there, is, there is different types of inquiry that are already uh, sort of encoded in the Quran. Uh, the Quran also emphasizes the superiority of those that employ their reason over those who simply follow their forefathers and their ancestors. Uh, or social conventions. And it advises a subsection of the Muslim community to dedicate themselves to study. So there's already um, a seed here of the emergence of, of people who, who primar whose primary uh, role is to dedicate themselves to knowledge, uh, to the preservation of knowledge and, and uh, uh, to scholarship. Likewise, uh, among the uh, quotations attributed to, uh, uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, we find uh, several uh, statements that, uh, uh, actually numerous statements uh, that emphasize the, the, uh, um, the obligation of Muslims to, uh, um, uh, to seek knowledge. Uh, one of the uh, famous hadith is that um, the seeking of knowledge is an obligation on, on every Muslim. Um, and based on, on these two sources, uh, we find very early on uh, Muslim theologians emphasizing that um, that the acceptance of Islam is based on reason, i.e. Uh, one's belief is only sound if it is a belief that is founded in reason, in reflection. An unreflected faith uh, is either, depending on which theological school you look at, either highly problematic or totally unacceptable. Um, but what is the general features of, of, of Muslim theologians is that uh, Islam is not a mystery religion. Uh, it, is not, it doesn't have some sort of unintelligible core where there's only a small elite that has this mystery knowledge about this. But it is uh, a religion that is open, that is uh, understandable, that is understandable through reason, and that has a, um, a rational connection to your everyday experience. So it doesn't say um, whatever you think uh, is true, it's the opposite. No, it says, you know, it, uh, Islam flows from your everyday experience. That's what the Quran says. Don't you look around you, don't you look at the change between day and night, and so on and so on. Um, um, so there is no uh, inherent break between religious doctrine and uh, uh, experience or exper experiential uh, 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 interaction with the world. Um, now the question is, where did uh, learning scholarship happen before the emergence of the madrasa, before um, something around the year 400 of the Islamic uh, calendar, where, where you have the first proper institutions that are called madrasas. Um, the, the, the primary place was uh, the mosque. The mosque as a public place in which people gathered 
uh, five times a day, uh, and where scholars uh, had a uh, set up um, uh, sessions uh, from very early onwards. We hear about scholars uh, sitting uh, at pillars um, in the mosque and having circles of scholars, uh, circles of students around them and teaching them. Um, and that's a natural development you know, before or after uh, prayers uh, of these, these uh, circles uh, emerging. At the same time, we, ha we have also uh, 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 reports about people teaching at their homes. And again, both of these phenomena still exist today. Um, the mosque and the, the private home are still uh, places of, uh, of, of teaching and of learning. Um, <clears throat> then sometimes in the, in the 11th century of the common era uh, in Iran, we have the emergence of what we could, could properly call a madrasa, which is a space that is specifically dedicated to study, um, and that is the, so that that, uh, that is endowed, i.e., somebody has uh, created an endowment, for example, a well or a market place or a piece of agricultural land, something like this, um, and has endowed this for the sustenance of this specific institution. So somebody builds a madrasa and then has some source of income for this madrasa that he endows, which means that it's not anymore his own property. Um, it is now there for the uh, sustenance of these institutions. We have the same thing today. Uh, uh, any private uh, university uh, has uh, an endowment in this country. Uh, that, is, that is a way in which to maintain uh, an institution beyond the, the lifetime of one individual. Uh, so you have this uh, uh, quite uh, revolutionary innovation, sometimes in the 11th century, and it spreads pretty quickly eastwards, westwards, uh, 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 westwards up to, up to Spain. If you go to Granada, I was there a couple of weeks ago, you can see there's madrasas that were established there, uh, and all the way uh, uh, to the east, India, Central Asia, Indonesia, uh, uh, you find madrasas there. In the south, um, you go to East Africa, you go to... Uh, 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 Zanzibar or something like this, you, you find madrasas there. Uh, you go to the north, uh, the, 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 um, today's Russia, uh, the Krim, or these kind of places, uh, you have madrasas. You go to Istanbul, you have uh, famous uh, madrasas that were built there by the Ottomans, and so on and so on. So it becomes uh, an extremely widespread phenomenon of education. Um, uh, the basic um, framework is everywhere the same. You need an endowment, somebody uh, who has the, the, the means, uh, whether it is uh, a private wealthy individual, whether it's a sultan who, um, uh, who builds uh, madrasas, um, uh, they, con they contain a, a physical space, they, they have professors whose, whose salaries are paid, and they have students who get a scholarship. Right? That is what the endowment pays for, for the upkeep of the place for the students, for the professors, and, you know, different places, different times. You have, you know, soup kitchens and so on and so on. Um, so relatively similar to, to, the, to the kind of academic system that we're used to today uh, from universities as well. Um, <clears throat> what, what are the topics that are taught at these universities, at these madrasas? Well, it depends. Um, the, the, the person who endows it has some saying in it by, by uh, endowing specific professorships, so uh, most of these madaris, or basically, I mean, the, I can't think of any that hasn't, uh, would teach Islamic law, um, but then there is a, a wide variety of things that can be taught. You have prophetic hadith, uh, Quran and exegesis, uh, theology, uh, but also uh, things that are, not that are not strictly speaking religious, grammar, logic, philosophy, mathematics, astronomy. Uh, these are topics uh, that uh, were traditionally taught and are still taught today in, 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 in the various madrasas that, that still exist today. Um, what happens to somebody who, uh, who graduates from a madrasa? Um, slightly in, in a contradistinction to today's university system, um, the main, um, classically speaking, uh, uh, the main qualification somebody gets out of a madrasa education is not a certificate from this specific madrasa in the sense of, you know, I'm a graduate of this and this madrasa, but more uh, it is the personal relationship to the teacher. 
somebody would rather say, I am a student of X. Uh, I received a, basically a degree uh, from, or an ijazah from this and this uh, uh, teacher. So this is a, uh, a quite a difference because what it means is that um, education wasn't necessarily linked to institutions. So you could, maybe Professor X was teaching in this in a specific madrasa, which means that he got his wage by teaching there. But he could be teaching on the side, people on the side. And that's, that's the normal thing that, that stu the teachers do. He might be teaching in his house, right? In the morning before he goes to, the, to teach at the madrasa, he might be teaching at his house. And there might be students who are not registered in the madrasa. There might be part-time students. There might be students who, for whatever reason, didn't get into the madrasa. So, and then afterwards, you kind of won't know because you know, it's about the degree you get from the individual, not from about, primarily about the, um, about the institution. Um, um, now, um, the, the, the history of the madrasa is, is, is an interesting one, and um, I don't want to go too much into this, but um, we find that in the, in the 19th century, with, with the coming of colonialism, um, the kind of the, the, the prestige of the madrasa is challenged, because now you have um, new institutions of learning. Um, university, uh, institutions that are called universities that are very often taught in a, in, in the, in a, in a European language, um, which are very often the gateway to the better careers, right, in government particularly, or in the, yeah, in the military, in government administration, etc., in, 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 in business, um, where um, uh, speaking a foreign language was important, and so suddenly, uh, what well you can imagine, most of the, bright, the brightest students will go to a different type of, uh, of educational institution, uh, which leads to a, a kind of crisis in, uh, uh, in the madrasa um, um, institution, but that does not in any way uh, uh, lead to the demise of the madrasa. There are some madrasas who, have, uh, who enacted uh, reforms, so for example, if you go to, to Egypt, to Al-Azhar, um, which was uh, um, the most um, important madrasa in, in Egypt, it has basically morphed in, in terms of its structure very much into a university system. Uh, so you have a specific cu curriculum. In a specific course you, ha you have a curriculum, somebody teaches it, and at the end you get a degree from this university. And it calls itself a university as, uh, as well. Um, uh, of course, there, you might have the question, to what extent is this university, to what extent is this still a madrasa? Uh, so you have these uh, hybrid um, institutions also in, uh, in the Muslim world. Um, so the, 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 the madrasa exists today. It um, offers, I mean, th there's no specific single curricula that, that, uh, that the madrasa, madaris uh, teach. Different areas have different curricula, different religious uh, uh, groups teach slightly different curricula. Um, uh, they are primarily focused on religious topics, so uh, you don't really go to a madrasa to teach natural, you know, to study natural sciences or something like this. Uh, they also teach auxiliary topics, literature, uh, uh, philosophy, uh, uh, similar topics. Um, let me now uh, move over to the uh, to the to the history and historical development of universities. Um, universities emerged. Um, slightly later than the, than the madrasas, uh, half a century to a century later, uh, Bologna was, uh, University of Bologna, the first European university was founded in 1088. Afterwards, Paris, Oxford, Cambridge, this was uh, 12th century. Um, um, these universities uh, very often had connections to, to the church, so the University of Paris, for example, was uh, was very close, uh, was basically su supervised by, uh, by the church, by the Pope himself. Uh, some not. Um, uh, the University of Bologna taught mainly law, uh, while uh, Paris was very strong in theology, was basically the leader of theology for, for several centuries. But religion also played a major role in universities. And um, uh, if you look at the, uh, at the history of Harvard University um, in, the, in the early uh, 18th century, uh, one Harvard professor by the name of Increase Mather uh, decided that uh, Harvard, Harvard wasn't any more religious enough. 
Harvard was founded as a, as a religious seminary by Puritans. But he decided it wasn't religious enough, so he moved to Connecticut, uh, and he and his, his son founded Yale University, uh, which was meant to you know, uphold the more pure uh, Puritan um, uh, ideal. Um. So we see that, um, that um, also uh, Western universities have very strong roots in uh, as, uh, as seminaries, as places where primar primarily uh, religion is taught. Um, now today, um, much of what we uh, think of when we think of, of universities uh, are natural sciences and, and, and the importance of the university being uh, natural scientific discoveries. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, um, I think it's, it's really crucial to keep in mind that, that university education for most of the his, uh, for most of the Western history, meant primarily uh, education in the humanities. Um, this really used to be the heart of the university. Uh, it used to be the the way in which young, primarily men, uh, were socialized into Western culture. Uh, and and it's also important to keep in mind how few people used to go to university. Uh, if, I, if I read the statistics right yesterday, it was, it was late, but I, I hope I, I read it right, um, uh, something like four to five percent of Americans used to go to, col uh, used to uh, go to college after the Second World War, uh, which has today risen to a quarter, up to a, up to a third. Um, but it was, it was an extremely uh, small minority who went to college. But those who did uh, really uh, received uh, kind of a common cultural basis. Uh, so the, uh, these people read the classics, for example, they, they read uh, Thucydides, Peloponnesian War, uh, or similar, uh, similar things that, that gave them a similar core of ideas, similar uh, core of ideas what it means to be virtuous, core of idea of what it means to be uh, um, uh, uh, a member of their community, whether it's you know, their national community, you know, what does it mean to be British, what does it mean to be uh, uh, Christian, etc., uh, etc. Et so it was. It was uh, the humanities served a very crucial role in giving an identity to the elite of to the educational elite of a specific country. Um, now, um, today we have uh, universities. Any uh, anybody who teaches in the humanities knows about this uh, 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 lament about the so-called um, um, uh, crisis in the humanities, which is basically that um, the natural sciences and, 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 and the, the, the social sciences, um, they have succeeded in generating very powerful tools for, for influencing our environment, uh, for building dams, for building planes, uh, for uh, developing complex economies, etc., etc. Um, but what do the humanities do? Uh, what do you do with the humanities? Um, what do you do with humanities in an age in which um, this, um, in which, in which uh, societies, first of all, many more people go to, 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 to university, but also in which it has become much more uh, diverse. Uh, so one of the uh, um, uh, slogans about, uh, uh, that we've seen from the 60s onwards is that, that all these, these, these classics that, we, that people read in the humanities, that's basically all dead white men, uh, uh, the, the writings of dead white men. And so um, you know, we have to open up the, the classics. We have to read new classics, maybe. Um, which is, uh, on the one hand, especially for somebody who's in Islamic studies, it's a very per, you know, positive uh, development, because uh, uh, now you have the opportunity to maybe introduce many interesting texts, fascinating texts that, that people weren't aware of. Uh, into the curriculum. But on the other hand, it also leads to a kind of crisis in the sense of, so what exactly is important? Um, if we do not have a single idea of uh, what it means to be human, I mean, that's you know, kind of a core anthropology that says, well, you know, we, we have an idea what it means to be human, we have an idea what human nature is, we have an idea what it is to behave virtuously, and we have an idea what, what kind of quality is. Um, so suddenly you don't know anymore, you know, is Socrates a good thing, or the Qur'an, or some celebrity Twitter feed, um, you know, what exactly is a classic, and how can we judge um, 
uh, what people should study and people, what people should not study and exactly what, who are we to tell our students uh, what they should do and what, what they shouldn't do. Um, uh, and, and, and part of the, 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 the issue here is that in both in the, um, uh, in the classical humanities and in the classical madrasa, um, there was um, a conviction that people in the past had to, that they had something they could teach us, that we had to kind of sit at their feet and, and learn from the sages of the past what to do. Uh, while, while today much of the humanities consist of kind of deconstruct, deconstructing these texts and, and critiquing these texts without really having something else to put in instead. Uh, so there's a kind of uh, a negative attitude towards it, but what exactly is it that we are putting in its, uh, in its place? Um, so um, what does that mean for, uh, for Islamic studies at universities? Um, Islamic studies at universities has um, a very complex, uh, uh, very complex history. Um, from the very early universities on that, that I mentioned, um, uh, Bologna, uh, Paris, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Leiden in, 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 in Holland, uh, all of these established chairs for Arabic and for Islamic studies very early on, um, 15th century, 16th century, some, you know, 13th century onwards. Um, because their the interest in Islam was, was not simply an, um, um, an academic interest, but it was, a, it was, it was an interest on, on different levels. So at the beginning, very often, this was a, a polemical missionary interest, uh, that the, um, uh, an interest in, in converting, um, uh, in, in facing Islam as a, as a competitor in, uh, with regards to, uh, to converts. Um, uh, later on, when that became less of a, a preoccupation of, of Western universities, um, uh, we have the state of colonialism. So we have a, a physical domination of Muslim countries, um, which then calls for expertise to manage this. So when Napoleon conquers Egypt in 1798, he brings with him a large contingent of Orientalists that write his letters and that study I mean, there's a, a large work, the description of Egypt, the description of Egypt that, that they write. I mean, he, so he, he conquers Egypt and he immediately unleashes his Orientalists to map everything and copy everything. And a lot of the Arabic manuscripts go to Paris. And uh, um, if you go to the Louvre, I mean, an enormous amount of, of, of stuff that was transferred to, uh, uh, to Paris. And as an Egyptian, I hope you are uh, appreciating that I use transfer, uh, the verb of transfer here. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, so, so th 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 there is a connection here with, with, uh, with, uh, between Orientalism and, and colonialism, um, and um, um, that is something that is uh, uh, that cannot be denied. And then, especially uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, you have um, there's also a connection to race theory. Uh, when when theories of race emerge, uh, anti-Semitism particularly, anti-Semitism. Uh, is used against uh, Arabs exact, you know, the same way as it is used against Jews. You read Orientalist writings from the late 19th century, Ernest Renan is, the, I think, the most uh, famous of them. Um, he will explain to you the history of the Arabs because of their racial features. Right? So the Arabs, uh, like the Jews, are um, uh, uh, Semites, and that's, uh, th that's the reason why they have such sterile civilizations. Right? They are, they're chained to the law, they're not creative, and you know, they're lucky that they had the Persians becoming Muslims because the Persians are Aryans, right? like us. us. Uh, and, uh, and of course, they are creative and they have philosophy and these kind of things. Um, so again, that is, that is another um, uh, very strong uh, issue that, that, that skews um, the, the, the study of, of Islam in, the, in, the Western, uh, in Western academia. Um, but um, um, apart from you know, the missionary uh, uh, heritage, the anti-Semitic heritage, the colonial heritage in Islamic studies, um, we have seen in the last decades, particularly in the United States, I would, I would say, um, um, a rise of, uh, uh, of Muslims in academia. So, uh, here, the University of Chicago with Fazlur Rahman, 1969, uh, the first, I mean, uh, as far as I know, really prominent 
um, a Muslim academic taking up um, uh, a chair of Islamic studies um, at a major university in the United States. Um, and so in the last 15 to 20 years, we, have a, we, have a, we see the phenomenon of Muslim, uh, Muslims who have uh, either here, I uh, studied either here traditionally or in, it's true, you know, he went to a school, which is madrasa, well, I guess. Um, so do, do you mean schools as in, you know, K to 12 schools or? Either K to 8 or K to 12, but full-time Islamic schools, mm -hmm. fully accredited Islamic schools in the U.S. Yeah, uh, the thing is, I don't know, I haven't really encountered people who have gone through this. Uh, it might be too recent to have produced enough people that I could have been in, co in contact with them in kind of in an academic uh, uh, setting. So I, I, unfortunately, I don't really have an opinion about this. If somebody else has, um, I'd be interested to hear it. But do you consider Darul Qasim as madrasa? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, madrasa in a kind of classical sense. Yeah, I think I mean they they, they teach a curriculum that is that is basically uh, the, the curriculum of. Uh, 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 Deoband, so it's, uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct, um, uh, which is a madrasa curriculum. So, and um, I have met some of its graduates, I'm very impressed by them. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's, that's absolutely, absolutely right. I mean, I remember I once talked, um, I showed a documentary about a um, um, Muslim judge in Niger. And, uh, um, you know, some of the Muslim students thought it was too, uh, I don't know, it was denigrating Islam because it showed this Muslim judge in a very simple environment, something like this. And I'm sorry, I, I just didn't see that. I mean, clearly there's, there's things you, 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 you know, people bring into the classroom and, and uh, I guess if you're a Muslim minority in a mainly uh, uh, Muslim environment, if you then te study Islam, you're kind of maybe more sensitive to this. Um, and so it's um, um, the, the, that students seek something else than what you can give in, a, in an academic uh, course at a, at, a, at a research university. Yeah, that, that's, I think that, that is the main reason why, why there is frustration, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you're absolutely right. But what um, uh, what I wanted to say is that it you can't really speak of uh, a single goal of uh, the modern university system. I think uh, in the realm of of humanities, I think the the, the cause of the anxiety that academics feel about the mod the, the humanities is that, that it just isn't that clear anymore what exactly the goal is and that we are very good at knocking down things but um, what are we going to build instead or you know, is there even anything to build? Uh, maybe it's just about knocking down things. I mean, but, but, you know, what exactly does that mean about education? What does it mean about what we're doing to, to students? Um, um, and what I'm saying is that um, um, this 
if you're in Islamic studies, um, um, you know, there, there's an old joke, Monty Python joke, you know, you can teach, uh, uh, one person was allowed to teach Marx in a philosophy department as long as he was telling the students that it was wrong. Uh, you know, that, that, that was the used to, I mean, that, that, that was basically the, the position in Islamic studies, uh, that the, um, um, there was such a strong kind of identity to, to universities and Western universities that um, uh, uh, Noel Colson, who, who taught Islamic law at, at Harvard for a while, apparently he made, I mean, his, his what he did at the beginning of the semester was he just picked out some Muslim students and then he humiliated them until they left the course and there was nobody left anymore. Um, that really doesn't happen anymore. Uh, so in that sense, uh, this kind of um, identity crisis is um, uh, positive in the sense that it does not anymore uh, mean that, that Muslim students are, uh, feel that, that they can take anything except courses on Islam because they are, you know, that, that, will, that will be impossible for them to do um, because of the environment. But at the same time, it also means that, um, uh, that the whole project of, of universities is in a, in a way um, in question. And um, um, I think, coming back to your, to, to, to your, to your uh, uh, question, it is that uh, I'm not saying that these are the same goals. I'm just saying that um, we have reached a point in which um, it is possible to have crossovers from both, from both directions. And um, uh, that, that these two poles are not so far apart that it's, that it's impossible. And these, uh, these crossovers, well, they'll have to decide what they do with it. Um, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not saying that you can be a full research university and a full seminary at the same time. Um, but I'm saying is that it is not anymore, uh, these are not anymore two worlds that, are, that, are not that, 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 are, that cannot communicate with each other anymore. Um, um, is that kind of, I, <laughs> I, I know I haven't quite hit your, your question, but um, um, uh, so, so what I'm saying is that there, there is a lot of, um, um, given that, that these identities are not fixed, on both sides. Um, there is a lot of room for individuals to um, explore uh, which positions exactly in the, they, are, they want to take. And uh, I think you can see people who, are, who have appointments at both research universities and maybe secondary appointments at, at, a, uh, at, a, at an Islamic seminary or vice versa. I think that, that is possible and that, that's not uh, going to um, discredit them at either. Anymore, I think. So, um, so okay, I was interested in uh, what your thoughts are on the idea that these hybrid institutions that you mentioned, or these crossover institutions, uh, can be seen as uh, the neoliberalization or the privatization of Islamic education in the West. The privatization? But I mean, is, is that public Islamic education in the West? Uh, well, yeah, I, I mean, like, the, Uh, uh, I mean, neoliberal is maybe a little, a little bit too big a term here. Um, um, education is, um, I mean, higher education um, in in classical Islamic education is is uh, is a is a private affair. I mean, okay, you might say these madrasas that were endowed by sultans are somehow public, but it's not. It's not that you have a public, you know. I mean public madrasa system, it's maybe a little bit too, too, too big to say that. So uh, I don't think it's, in that sense, it is somehow um, uh, a, an Amer Americanization, Americanization uh, of Islam by having you know, private institutions. I think they've, they've always been more or less private. Uh, even if it was the Sultan who endowed it, it was basically the Sultan as a private individual who did it. Um, um, I, I mean, I just, just to give you an example, I mean, slightly aside here, I was in Germany a couple of months months ago, and um, 
um, they established a system of uh, uh, Islamic th uh, theological faculty uh, um, departments um, where they want to teach Islam to Muslims by Muslims, uh, according to the, uh, the same, because they have the same system for uh, Catholic and uh, Protestant uh, theology. Uh, but the problem is that they have nobody to teach there, because uh, even though Germany has an, an amazing his, you know, tradition of, of oriental, uh, oriental studies, they ba managed to basically uh, not uh, uh, produce any Muslims uh, uh, who could teach now. So they are hiring people who don't know German, who are meant to teach Germans, German Muslims, Islam in German, but they have to teach them in English or something like this because they haven't, they, you know, the, 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 the academic system, um, I think, and, you know, I, I'm saying this as, as a non-American, but uh, you know, respect to the American system that has at least not succeeded in totally excluding Muslims um, in the past. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I uh, totally agree that there is, um, you know, I, I, I highlighted uh, as, as a kind of um, uh, commonality, uh, dedication to, um, uh, to inquiry, to free inquiry, to rational inquiry. Uh, of course, there, is, um, uh, there are some things that are, that are not possible in a, in a modern university. I mean, there's something called um, 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 naturalism, uh, which means that you cannot, you cannot explain, you know, in, 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 in academic discourse you cannot explain some things by higher, uh, by uh, supernatural uh, means. Um, that's a really good, it's a really good rule uh, for academic uh, inquiry, uh, but of course uh, for actual religious discourse, as religious discourse, of God, it, it kind of, it excludes the possibility of God from the very beginning. Uh, or you, ha you, know, you have to explain it by something else. Um, um, methodological naturalism. But uh, that, that doesn't mean that it's... Uh, I mean, it means that, that, that within the specific academic discourse you cannot use God as an, uh, as an explanation. That is true. Uh, and I, I wasn't claiming that therefore you... Uh, uh, you, could, you know, Madras and University is the same thing. I, I didn't say that. I just said that you have overlaps to the extent that you can have people who benefited from both systems uh, and who are not culturally schizophrenic uh, and who are not, uh, who don't, don't become outcasts because of that in either, in either system. Um, uh, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that, that uh, modern universities has, have got a specific aim and that is certainly not the promulgation of any religious belief and that's why, you know, you know, if you have a research university and you have like a divinity school, it always creates tensions. I mean, it's, uh, that's not something just about Islam, it's about any kind of religious uh, uh, sentiment. You know, you go to the University of Chicago, the divinity school, they have, you go to the caf cafeteria, they, have, they, they wear t-shirts where it says, where God drinks coffee. I mean, it's like, you know, trying to be kind of all cynical, funny, whatever. I mean, you know, what kind of divinity school? I mean, you know. Are you taking this serious or is this some sort of joke you're kind of engaging in? I don't know. I mean, uh, there, there are tensions and you know, people you know, outside of the divinity school say, you know, 
what does the divinity school here do at the university? Yeah, I, I, so I, I, I get the point that, um, that these, are, the, these are different types of talking about religion. They're different types, they have different ground rules. But that doesn't mean that, um, that, first of all, you can't have somebody engaging in both of these discussions and be still, you know, I mean, it's just, they're different ground rules. You cannot, I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if you talk to somebody, um, if you're Muslim, you talk to somebody who's Muslim, you can take things for granted, right? If you talk to somebody who's an atheist, you can't take things for you can't take things for that you can't take for granted that he thinks that Muhammad is a prophet. That's just how it is. And it's just a ground rule of discussion. It doesn't mean that you have to thereby, you know, shed yourself, you know, your belief or something like that. It's just the different rules of of, uh, of intellectual intellectual uh, uh, exchange. So um, thank you for these uh, for these uh, uh, clarifications on, on, on what I've said. First of all, thank you for taking time and educating us in this important discussion. Uh, we started with the premise that Madras and University are somehow more in common with each other, and you know they are different. But Madras, as we all know, that represent the Eastern approach teaching, whereas the university is more Western concept, and in between there is it merged. So my question has to do with the era of Islam and the blossoming and flowering.